You're listening to Thunder Quack Podcast Network. Hi, my name is Larry Lieber, and you're listening to the Epic Marvel Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Epic Marvel Podcast. This is Amazing Spider-Man Episode 1, Great Power, covering a period of Spider-Man from 1962 to 1964. This is our first Spider-Man episode. If you're listening to this in chronological order, this is the beginning, the the origin of Spider-Man and all of his famous villains. However, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you'll know that this is not the first episode of Spider-Man because just like the Epic Collections, they release their volumes out of order, we're releasing our episodes out of order. So I've already released a bunch of episodes about Spider-Man from the 80s and 90s with my co-host Adam, but joining me for the 60s and the 70s Spider-Man episodes, uh, I have a new co-host all the way from France, this is Frank. Hi Frank. Hi Curtis, thank you very much for having me, it's really a blast. Now, what is your association with Spider-Man? Have you been a fan of Spider-Man for a number of years, or are you brand new to this stuff? Spider-Man is the reason I wanted to learn how to read, basically. Well, there you go. (laughs) (laughs) So so I'm a huge, huge fan of Spider-Man. And um, I started, uh, I'm 45, uh, and I started reading Spider-Man in the French TV Guide because they were reprinting the the, the Spidey uh, strip from the newspaper okay, with fantastic art by John Romita. So that got me hooked in a second. And at the same time in France, so that was in the late 70s, at the same time in France, they were re-broadcasting uh, the, the cartoon uh, from the 60s, mm-hmm. the, the American cartoon from yeah. the 60s. And because the publishing schedule in France was absolutely crazy, we were in 77 78 we were at the at the beginning of the jerry conway era of spider-man so uh 110 or something like that so i got started on spider-man with conway and uh, and romita senior which was a great moment to 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 start so if uh, the, the day we make the the goblin last 10 episode it would be my Big, big, big moment on Spider-Man. Okay, wow. Uh, what a place to start. Yeah, no, not bad, not bad at all. And I still continue to read Spidey to this day, and I think I have um, 90, 90% of the Amazing Spider-Man run, uh, wow. one way or another. That's fantastic, yeah. Yeah, it's my favorite. It's really my favorite character. This is great. Well, I'm glad to have you on the show here. I know you're also a big John Romita fan. Uh, what do you think of mm. Steve Ditko? So it, it's funny because I, I started reading the Ditko stuff after reading the Romita stuff. So initially, I really hated Ditko uh, because it didn't look the, the, like Romita. And for the same reason, I hated Ross Andrew when he took over after Romita left. Ditko, when you you read it afterwards, becomes an acquired taste, and uh, and I really love what he did, visually speaking, in terms of choreography and the layouts and uh, and the fight scenes, and uh, it's less of a glamorous character than the the Romita era, of course, but it's a fantastic ride. It's such a fun book to read, and uh, and it's very different visually, very different in terms of storytelling, in terms of story full stop uh, so now I've really become a, a big Ditko fan as well yeah I think I agree with you there saying that Ditko's an acquired taste I would have to agree with you there I mean the Spider-Man I started reading I guess it was like Eric Larson Alex Saviak it was the 80s and <laughs> yeah, and then yeah going back and seeing Ditko was like this guy is it's, it's kind of more rough it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit ugly 
But mm. when you say, but I just had to learn what Ditko was, and I completely appreciate what he does these days, his contributions, the way he lays things out, like you say, he, there's a reason why he's, he's so popular and, and well-loved and well-regarded, because he is a great storyteller, and he's a great artist. Mm. And I think just yeah. as a, a younger, I didn't appreciate that when I'm comparing it to kind of the more slick stuff that I was seeing in modern days. But but I had the same problem, for instance, talking about the FF with Kirby, because when I started reading, it was John Buscema or Rick Buckler or uh, with Joe Sinat. So when you get back to the early Kirby days with Dick Ayers inking, it's very different. So it's it really difficult to get into it. Uh, so I had the same problem with Ditko, but uh, those became a quiet taste. Mm-hmm. Yep, you, you have to put yourself into the era in which these comics are made. And that's not just for the artwork. It also mm. is also for Stanley's writing because he's a very verbose writer. Uh, writing in the 60s mm. is very different than modern writing. So when you look at these, and uh, especially with stereotypes ab- about women and that kind of stuff too, it's like you have to remember, you have to put yourself back into that 1960s um, era mm. and think about what you're reading in that context. And, you know, it's hard when I want to hand, because I've handed this book to my son so he could read it. And I feel like I need to just say, just, just so you know, here, here's the things from the 1960s that that are not quite the same these days. In this book, it's not too bad in that sense. There's no like racial stereotypes, uh, like there are in, in Iron Man, for instance. Like yeah, Iron Man with the Mandarin and um, mm. yeah, all the communists, the the Asian communists that he fights and that kind of stuff. But uh, but yeah, so this is this is great. It the other thing that's stunning about this is that every single one of the villains in this book except for maybe two uh, yeah. s- stay around and they stick and they are all they're all fantastic you can't make that claim with too many uh, superheroes it, it, it's, it's really incredible when you look at the lineup of the villains in, in this book it's like a home run each time or almost each time every so single it's time really, yep. and uh, it, it's incredible to see that uh, when you compare for instance with the Fantastic Four or other characters. Uh, Spider-Man has this incredible uh, villain gallery after 15 issues. Most of it was there. And most of it is still there years, decades after. That's incredible, really. Yeah. The, I think that's the, the, the main power of this, uh, of this collection. And this is where the, the question of who did what comes up. Because we don't know the division of, of labor um, between Stanley and Ditko, we know that um, that they worked together, but they were also very separate. Like they, and I don't know when they stopped talking to each other, but at some point they even kind of didn't really communicate. As Stan would just send over the plots, Ditko would send them over the artwork, and there'd be no back and forth between the two. So, who who really did what? We don't know. But just looking at the Rogues Gallery. All of these villains have a much more Ditko feel than, say, the villains in Fantastic Four, because the villains in Fantastic Four are a lot more just over-the-top, outlandish, bombastic. These villains mm. are way more into thinking about just a, a more more flipping the human nature on its head and trying to get into a... Um, the way people think and that kind of thing. So, you you know, you don't have the red ghost and the super apes in no. Amazing Spider-Man, but you have mm. you have Craven the Hunter and Dr. Octopus, tortured kind of villains that, uh, you know, are trying to make a name for themselves and that kind of thing. So, And also, yeah. most of them are thieves. Yes. Basically, what they do is they steal stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. It. So they're not trying to take over the world or something like that, something that you would see in the FF. So that's, um, that's also the, the, the big difference between the type of characters. And yep. it's, uh, uh, in terms of the change that we would see with the Romita era, uh, we would see that there are much less new, fantastic new villains created after the Coast departure. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of new villains created, but they're not all winners. Yeah, the Gibbon is not really <laughs> the vulture, for instance. He is the one that people go to when they talk about <laughs> villains created during Romita's run. That's my first Spider-Man in oh, French, yeah. by the way. Okay. The, yeah, the Gibbon story. And I loved it. So, well, a, you know, 
it's not that bad for me. You know? Right, right. So what issues are we talking about in this episode? So we're talking about uh, Amazon F- Fantasy issue 15, and then Amazing Spider-Man 1 to 17, and uh, Annual 1. Yeah, so this is a good good bunch of, uh, of issues here. But just before we go on to the, the episode, I want to uh, talk a little bit about a Twitter poll that I put out. Mm. Now, these, these issues are so well-loved. Um, and well known. I didn't really know what to, what kind of Twitter poll to put out here. I could have said something like "Who's your favorite villain?" But there's so many villains to choose from, and Twitter only lets you have four options. So, like, how do you decide? So instead, I decided to go a different direction. I said, "What is the best line from Amazing Fantasy number 15?" Because there are a lot of great one-liners. Stanley loves his one-liners. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the four mm-hmm. options I give you are. Are you kidding? That bookworm wouldn't know a cha-cha from a waltz. <laughs> second, second option, give our regards to the Atom Smashers, Peter. Uh, number three, gosh, Uncle Ben, you're worse than a, a room full of alarm clocks. Mm-hmm. And uh, fourth option, you stick to science, son. We'll take the chicks. Mm. So what do you think? What, what's your pick for uh, best one-liner here, Frank? Well, the, the first one, are you kidding? That bookworm wouldn't know Cha-Cha from a wall. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's, really, it's really funny. And uh, I mean, the, and that's the first joke you get. So that's the main character we're talking about. And that's he's true. hidden in the background. The guys are laughing at him. So These days, I, I don't think anybody would know. Um, well, I mean, there's a few that are really into dancing, but who could tell you Cha-Cha from a waltz these days? I mean, I guess waltz mm. I. Yeah, I probably could identify them. I couldn't dance them for you, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Certainly establishes the, the era when it was written from yeah, the beginning. Right, it does. Um, I really like the line, give our regards to the Atom Smashers, Peter, because it's actually, it sounds cool, but it's meant to be an insult. But I think it's just a cool line. <laughs> I'd use it as a uh, as a line. And the Atom Smasher, by the way, is a great name for a, for a superhero. Yeah. That's one in DC, I guess. Oh, is there? Is there one already? Uh, no, I know. Well, I can't remember, that, but the, the Atom Smasher thing rings a bell anyway. Okay. Yeah, there probably is. Well, anyway, the votes came out 7% each for Atom Smashers and Room for, Full of Alarm Clocks. And um, mm-hmm. the Cha Cha Waltz line got 36% of the votes. And the, the most popular one was You Stick to Science, Son, We'll Take the Chicks. <laughs> Which is a very 60s kind of sentence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. one student is referring to the other student as son. I think that's kind of funny too. Mm. Okay, so I asked people to give their comments about uh, this volume. And over on Facebook, we got a bunch of comments. Billy says, great character that has stood the test of time. Ditko was a genius. Um, Jason says, I think that this run survives the test of time more than any of the other runs of the early Marvel age. It is one that I still revisit from time to time and appreciate it more every time. James calls this Stan Lee's masterpiece. Fabian Mm -hmm. says the design of Spider-Man's costume was ahead of its time. While others relied on capes, buccaneer boots, domino masks, trunks, and costume standbys, the addition of webs made this costume an attention grabber, and now costumes seem militaristic in design and cease to stand out. Uh, Adam says, it will be weird to listen to an episode of Amazing Spider-Man that I am not a part of. Is this how it felt for Ditko when J- John Romita took over? <laughs> I thought that, thought that was funny. Mm. Andy says, volume one introduces almost all of the greatest rogues gallery of any superhero. Mm. have to agree with that. Uh, maybe second only to Batman. But then yeah. Batman had to build his up over time. Spider-Man had a rose, an amazing rose gallery after just 17 issues. Mm, exactly. That's, uh, that's, I think that's unique. Very, very unique. Mm. Chris says, thoughts? Jeez, where to start? So much has been said about this run. Lee was so good at telling stories that kids or teenagers or rather outcast teenagers could relate to. Spider-Man, X-Men, Fantastic Four... And what sort of trouble are they having out of the costume? But no doubt it's Ditko. His portrayal and movements of Spider-Man was ahead of its time. 
angles and backgrounds came into play and helped New York City become a character too. Very true. And then Joshua, last comment here from Joshua. He says, I love the intro stories to not only Spidey, but to his villains. He had some of the best villains of any hero. So yeah, we're we're hearing a lot of the same comments over and over again here. Ditko was a genius. Um, mm. t- stood the test of time. The villains are amazing. And all of those things are kind of what define this book here. Great comments. Yeah. Well, let's jump right in here and talk about Amazing mm-hmm. Fantasy number 15. Why don't you start us off here and give us a short recap? Oh, do we need to recap this story? We probably don't. <laughs> in fact, this is the thing. Whenever there's a new Spider-Man movie or they reboot the franchise, I'm like, just skip the origin story. Everyone knows the origin story. And Spider-Man Homecoming mm. did that, and I was happy about that. Um, yeah, because, it, well, we've read the story, obviously, so many times with uh, the moment when Spider-Man gets his powers and uh, we have the death of Uncle, Uncle Ben and we have the wrestling and we have all these funny things. And then the, the, the fact that he did try to become a popular character or, and try to become famous and make money out of his powers is really interesting. That's one of the very cool things because it will stick and something that, that will come back in forthcoming issues as well. And then obviously we have, the, the, well, as I said, the, the burglar escaping and the, uh, Spider-Man letting him go, and which leads to the, uh, with great power, also comes great responsibility thing. So th- that's all there is. It's like, uh, as I was taking notes, I, uh, I said it was a blueprint, uh, a blueprint story. I mean, it's the, 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 the one you, you, you can almost analyze every other story by and say, okay, this works. This is, it's really a great story. It really is. And in 15 pages, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but we will get back to that because most of these stories are so jam-packed with stuff. I mean, it's really difficult to to sum up what's taking place because there's so much going on. And in, in these 15 pages, same thing. We get all the, 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 the characters introduced. We get Peter's family, the high school aspect, uh, the burglar. All that takes place in 15 pages and, and it's really amazing. And when you consider that it took six issues of Ultimate Spider-Man to, to tell a similar story to 15 years ago, you can see the difference of how in fact, uh, those stories were in the, back then. <laughs> That's true. Well, you're talking about also pages that have like, you know, six to nine panels per page, whereas Ultimate Spider-Man usually had like four panels per page and a lot of splash yeah. pages. So yeah, there's and there's a lot of padding in that one too. I really appreciate mm. Ultimate Spider-Man for what it for what it did. Mm. Love it too. Yeah. But to uh, to be able to do that and be super effective in fifteen pages is another talent altogether. When you see how long it takes just to discover the costume for the first time, I mean, it, it wouldn't it, it couldn't uh, work like that anymore. I mean, it's just he, he basically creates the, the the costume between panels, and you <laughs> right. see the mask on the first panel on the top right, and then you see him creating his, his spinners, and then he's on wearing the costume, and that's it. So let's back up a little bit and talk about Amazing Fantasy, the title. This is the 15th mm. issue. Um, all of, uh, not all of Mar- Marvel's titles, but most of Marvel's titles back in this day were sort of anthology comics where they would have a bunch of short stories in, t- in one book. Um, and this mm. was no exception. Amazing, it used to mm. be called Amazing Adult Fantasy, because mm. I think that, not that it's erotic or anything like that, but because they had, uh, they just had sort of a more mature tone to their stories. And uh, there were five of them per issue, and they would all be created by people like Steve Ditko and um, Dick Ayers and Larry Lieber and Jack Kirby, a bunch of little mm. kind of sci-fi and, you know, outer limits kind of stories. And, and it wasn't doing well. And so the publisher was going to cancel the book. And so mm. gave Stanley kind of permission to do whatever he wanted to do. And he came up with his concept, Spider-Man. And uh, the, included in this epic collection is the last, on the last page of this issue is um, important announcement from the editor and talks a little bit about why 
this title is going to go undergo some changes. And they say here that Spider-Man will appear every month in Amazing Fantasy. And perhaps if your letters requested, we will make his stories even longer or have two Spider-Man stories per issue. So that didn't actually happen. This title did get canceled after 15 issues and uh, mm-hmm. with, with 15 being the Spider-Man issue. And that was, let's see, this one came out cover dated August 1962. And then it took some time, but Amazing Spider-Man number one came out March 1963. So a good like nine mm-hmm. months later or so. But Amazing Fantasy kind of just morphed into Amazing Spider-Man. And if you look at the first few issues of Spider-Man, they're actually made up of two stories each. So yeah. um, they had every intention of continuing Spider-Man through, but um, it didn't quite happen the way they thought it was going to. Yeah, because uh, issue one, two of uh, of Amazing Spider-Man would be would have two stories each. So yeah, it's very likely, and it seems like uh, issue one of Amazing Spider-Man was almost uh, right after was produced almost right after uh, Amazing Fantasy 15 because the, yeah. be, because of the way the art looks and uh, and all that yeah and even Spider-Man doesn't have a hyphen sometimes uh, yeah mm. there's just these are all written as short 15 page stories that could easily be part of the Amazing Fantasy title but then that one got cancelled mm. and they've got these stories that were already in the works so they created Amazing Spider-Man I, I think that one of the things which now uh, annoys me the most in the in the visual of, of this book is that I think, and I originally thought like this anyway, that everybody looks so old. Uh, I mean, the teenagers don't look like teenagers at all, and the older people look immediately in the middle of their 40s or in their 50s, and... Aunt May and Uncle Ben look like they are ninety year old. Yeah, right. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially when just all the teenagers are hanging around in school, it looks like they're a bunch of young adults. Like it's college, not mm. high school. It's true. Yeah. So it's something which annoyed me a, a, a lot because I couldn't really relate with this character who is supposed to look to be fifteen or sixteen and looks twenty something, but. That's the way it was drawn then, so you have to get into the to get into it and accept that. Yeah. But I think that Peter Parker looked more his age in the in the seventies and the eighties and and since then than he did back then in the in the in the early issues. That's my main concern regarding the art. Yeah, exactly. Mm. But, uh, I don't know if you know that there was a funny sort of retcon of uh, Amazing Fantasy 15 in the <laughs> Brian Bendis book, Elias. There are so many retcons. I do know of um, a Michael Bendis retcon that's coming up in issue four, but why don't you clue me mm-hmm. into uh, what's going on here? You, you know Jessica Jones, yes. the, the, the character. Yep. And uh, when, if you read the original Elias book, uh, she was in the background of this story. So when they to- when Brian Bendis told the origin of Jessica Jones, she was uh, a girl who had a crush on Peter Parker. And uh, in those two stories, I can't remember which issues of, uh, of Alias they take place in, but she's in the background when uh, when the kids uh, are mean to Peter in the first two pages, and uh, she's sitting in the background and looking at Peter with, you know, uh, puppy eyes, and uh, she's even following him when he gets beaten by the spider. There is an actual um, panel. In, let's revisit this when we get to the Sandman mm-hmm. issue because there's an actual panel that they use as an example of where Jessica Jones is. But yeah, I mean, there are lots of other retcons that happen here. Like, for instance, after the spider bit Peter, it goes and bites someone else, Cindy Moon, oh, who yeah. becomes the character Silk. Uh, so there, yeah. that's just yeah. another op- another example of the way this has kind of been retconned as well. Writers over the years have really explored every single aspect of it. They've they've taken a look at Crusher Hogan. Uh, they've mm. take, they've explored the burglar. Aunt May and Uncle Ben, of course, are dissected left and right. And just every single aspect of this story has been further explored mm. over the years. Because there's so there's so little that is said in this story itself that between each panel you could fit well some have fitted stories between two panels of, uh, of this so 
uh, it's really because it goes so fast and uh, there's not so much you know and uh, when you consider the time it, w it would take before you, you, you find out about Peter's parents for instance it would take six or seven years I think before Stanley addresses the topic of the origin and how his parents uh, died uh, so there's so much that uh, that was unsaid uh, after those uh, 15 pages in fact I read a story um, just recently from 2014 it's called Spider-Man Learning to Crawl it's a Spider-Man mm -hmm. 1.1 to 1.4 or something like that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I have that somewhere it's fantastic I really loved it it tells a story of a supervillain oh man I can't remember the supervillain's name now but um, he's isn't a isn't it a guy from his high school who, has, yep. uh, who, who becomes a supervillain super exactly it's a story of this guy of this kid who really looks up to Spider-Man creates his own super mm -hmm. suit tries to be a hero but then just through a series of events nothing that Spider-Man really does gets snubbed by Spider-Man a few times and eventually it's his descent into becoming a super villain and it's told between the panels of the first seven or eight issues of Amazing Spider-Man mm -hmm. and, and Amazing Fantasy number 15 it works its way through weaves it in and out it's it's really really great and then that mm -hmm. character comes back in um, Dan Slott's Spider-Man in fact, I think this miniseries is written by Dan Slott as well. But uh, yeah, it's worth checking out. Mm. And ju even just to say to see how all of this stuff weaves in behind the scenes and between the panels and doesn't ruin any continuity at all. It's, it's just really great. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I think we could talk about Amazing Fantasy number... F oh, no, there's one more thing I want to say about Amazing Fantasy number 15. It's the famous line at the end here that you know it's mm. now credited to Uncle Ben but Uncle Ben doesn't actually say it it's narration right. in this issue mm. um, and the line is with great power there must also come great responsibility and it's often misquoted and I think it's um, I, I think that it's uh, too bad that it's misquoted because it, the, the quote that people usually say is with great power comes great responsibility but it says mm. With great power, there must also come great responsibility, which means that when you have great power, the responsibility doesn't come automatically. People take great power and do terrible things with it all the time. No, it's up to you to put that responsibility on yourself to use it to use it wisely. It, you must also have this great responsibility. It's true, and uh, and it was really. I think it was in I mean, Spider-Man Fifty that it was sort of rewritten into something that Uncle Ben said to oh, yeah. to Peter, but it wasn't there in the first place, yes. Yeah. What, yeah. what I'm the, the one of the things that makes me laugh the most in this story is in this page as well, is the fact that uh Ditko drew dots on Spider Man's eyes when yeah. he catches the burglar. So that's what that, that that's very that's very strange in the first place. And uh, I don't know if you know that but uh, when they reprinted uh, that story in Marvel Tales years later, they removed the dots. Right, I guess I can understand that. The, the, because it felt out of place or strange or something. And now they have been obviously reintroduced and every reprint of Amazing Fantasy XV has dots. Uh, but there was a time when Marvel maybe was not that comfortable with that idea. Yeah. Well, I think it gives a, a different sort of intensity um, mm. Because nowadays you can show so much emotion through Spider-Man's mask because you make the eyes bigger or smaller. You can move that around. But Ditko didn't do that at all. Uh, no. he, he kept the mask looking exactly the same every time because it is just a mask. It, it shouldn't show emotion. But by putting those dots in there, you really get a sense of surprise, Peter's surprise at the face of the killer. And, and really on this on this specific panel it really looks like he drew the face and added the mask on top of the face mm. because you can clearly see the, the layout of the of the nose and the chin and everything yeah. uh, so that that, that was uh, one of the great examples of how Ditko could manage to, to to give some emotions to the to the character yeah well let's keep on going here to amazing uh, amazing spider-man number one and mm. there are two stories in this one. The first story it doesn't really have a title, but the epic collection um, uses the the jeers from the crowd 
uh, Freak Public Menace as the title of this of this story here. And it's part recap, telling, giving us the origin in case we missed it in Amazing Fantasy, which at the time would be totally understandable because uh, this is just mm-hmm. everything was on the newsstand. But uh, this introduces us to J. Jonah Jameson and his son, John Jameson. And mm-hmm. he is uh, an astronaut going into outer space. And J. Jonah Jameson is a reporter covering it. And something goes wrong with the launch, and Spider-Man has to kind of go in and try to save save the day, and he does. But J. Jonah Jameson, this is the first time Spider-Man gets smeared in the newspapers. Hmm. So it's a it's just a short little story. Um, and let me just give you the recap of the next part, just so that we can get both of them out of the way. Then we can talk about this. Um, the second half hmm. is Spider-Man versus the Chameleon, Spider-Man's first villain. A lot of people know this one, too. It's a very famous story of Spider-Man trying to join the Fantastic Four. He thinks it's a paying gig, but when he finds out it's not, then he kind of gets out of there. And uh, meanwhile, someone is masquerading as Spider-Man, creating uh, crime-stealing things. And we find out that it's the chameleon, master of disguise. Spider-Man has to go in there and save the day, and he does. So as far as first issues go... Um, this is great. Uh, the J. Jonah Jameson and John Jameson story is a little, it's just a little tame. If this one was really indeed created for Amazing Fantasy, then they were just kind of, they weren't thinking about the whole superhero, supervillain thing quite yet. Yes, can you? I was listening to another podcast called Make Ours Marvel, and they were talking about this issue, and they were saying that this uh, John Jameson is basically john glenn yeah true that's true and uh, it was it would have been a contemporary at the time john glenn's the first man to um fly around the earth in in outer space that is not like in a plane and even if you look at pictures of john glenn and you compare it to the picture of of him on on page 24 Mm-hmm. Where he's in his um, where he's in his astronaut outfit. If you look up, if you just Google images of John Glenn wearing his astronaut outfit, it's like exactly the same. Ditko was. Oh. It looks like Ditko was taking a picture of John Glenn and putting it right into the comic here. So that's kind of cool. Very good point. What I found surprising is that obviously there is a recap of the of the origin, but we completely skip the the fact that Spider Man is responsible of the death of Uncle Ben. Right. When yeah. there's the recap, uh, because it, it just happens to be that there's a burglar uh, at the house and he kills Uncle Ben, but it's not mentioned that there's a connection between the, the, the burglar and uh, uh, and Spider-Man's attempt to be a, a showman or something. Uh, so that was uh, the that may be one of the first retcons <laughs> of the Silver Age, uh, very quickly <laughs> after after the after the first appearance. Uh, obviously, the, it's it's great to see that JJJ is there from the beginning, um, and what we see with this or this story and the next one as well, we already see, already see a lot of things that will be there forever you know, on Spider-Man. The fact that he's afraid of having his identity being uh, becoming public, the fact that he's always desperate to find money uh, because Aunt May is uh, is trying to. To, to make money out of uh, our jewelry and, and, and so on and so forth. So all, all this social uh, context that we would see in, in Amazing Spider-Man is already there from the first issue as well. And the fact that he's a misunderstood character is also already there from the beginning because uh, it may be because uh, J. Jonah Jameson is a jerk, but uh, somehow this character being not really understood uh, is, is already there and um, he thinks he's going to be the hero of the day and obviously is treated and considered as a, uh, as a threat so that's very that's very interesting yeah yeah there's it's it's so neat to see all of this kind of just in one issue and then carrying through also the themes of like spider-man or peter parker doesn't get along with the students at school and yeah and then and the mm. newspaper articles and everything so it's uh yeah, it's 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 a lot of fun. Regarding Peter, and that's something that we would see in forthcoming issues as well. I was, uh, as I read that again years after, I was really wondering: is he not getting along with the others, or is he also a bit of a jerk with them? Right. Yeah, man. Sometimes he's just brutal toward the other people. 
and, and it's really not that nice most of the time. And uh, uh, he provides one-liners and, uh, uh, you know, about them being dumb and, and so on and so forth. So obviously he was, he, he was bullied most of the time by Flash Thompson and, and a lot of other guys. But there is a part also where he's not really a nice person. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a lot of um, just being a selfish, self-absorbed teenager is part of that. Mm. Uh, because he doesn't, he's not like that as a as an adult. And a lot of people who are, a lot of teenagers who are like that, you know, they mature as they get through their early adulthood and become different people. I think mm. Peter is under a lot of stress uh, with the death of his uncle and with the new powers and everything. He, and all the villains he fights, he should probably be in therapy. And so he takes it out on his students at school a lot of the time. Yeah, it's yeah. true. There's also an Ant-Man reference in on page number 22. Oh, and, and of course, yeah, so Spider-Man's looking at a newspaper and he says, uh, Oh, yeah. How do other superhuman guys like the Fantastic Four and Ant-Man get away with it? So Fantastic Four and Ant-Man were the only superheroes that were around before Spider-Man. At the same time that Spider-Man debuts, uh, Thor also debuts and Human Torch gets his own series. So when he says other superhuman guys, he's literally listing off the entire Marvel universe at the, that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, f from the beginning, he establishes the connection between the between all of them. Yep. And, uh, that, and that's what happens uh, immediately in the second story. He, he clear, Stanley automatically establishes the, the, the connection between Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four. And of course, Fantastic Four was selling really well at the time. So, what better way to mm. sell their new superhero than put the Fantastic Four on the front cover and feature them in the story? So, yeah, this is a great story because it is. Um, I, I love it. I I had this one in a little mini comic that I think mm. got handed out at Halloween. It was like an Ashcan edition, and uh, and I so I read this story over and over and over and over again. It was paired with the uh, fantastic, sorry, with the the Human Torch Spider-Man little mini battle that that's in a few issues from now. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so I have great fond memories of this. What I find really interesting is that the Fantastic Four in this one is drawn by uh, Ditko, whereas they mm, had only ever been drawn by Jack Kirby before this. And it's really what I really like is the way that obviously Ditko is using different aspects of the Fantastic Four and the way he draws Mr. Fantastic is great because he's using him in a different way with uh, his head moving uh, by itself or him uh, trying to protect Spider-Man from the thing, uh, you know, in, the, in this panel. And it's really a different, uh, different approach of the Fantastic Four. So... It's re it's really great to, to to see that to see them differently. Yeah, there's one panel where Peter Parker is referred to as Peter Palmer. Uh, this one's a, a mistake that is always pointed out by people <laughs> mm -hmm. because they didn't quite have the name straight or firmly cemented in their minds at this point. And, and since Stan was both writer and editor, he wouldn't read this stuff again, I guess. So it got through. Yeah, which is uh, which is logical. And uh, well, the comedian is a is a is a very interesting villain because it's um, it's also very funny because the, f from the beginning they are not using a traditional villain; they are using a villain which who's masquerading uh, the, the the main character. So that's the, the it, it, it's a different approach than having uh, a traditional uh, bad guy. And of course, we've read uh, what happens with the comedian afterwards. Uh, but from the beginning, we see that he's only a spy trying to steal uh, some plants and that he wants to sell to countries of the behind the iron cut curtain. That's, uh, that's all he says. So uh, we will see later on, of course, a lot of background added to that. But it's interesting to see that the, the first villain is fighting the, uh, maybe an American guy or someone we don't know where he's coming from because we never see him without his mask. So we don't know if he's a mutant or if he's it's um, something that is why his head is like that uh, so there is no explanation of all that and he's a spy yep. so it's not really he has no real agenda except that maybe making money out of selling plants to uh, other countries and there's no real um, sci-fi or fantasy bent to his character at all um, 
later no. on he'll gain powers that allow him mm. to change his form just as uh, just with a click of a button but now yeah he's literally just a guy who is a master of disguise who can create different costumes and and faces for himself so i like that that aspect and yeah mm. th- that's another thing about just the ditko villains that we're talking about like they're they're normal people with a weird bend to them rather than super people in fact there are very few mm. super people in this book i think maybe we'll see maybe just like two or three of them that are actually super people mm. and what is funny in the, uh, in the last page of the story is that spidey saves the day but not purposely it's uh, it's almost an accident that it uh, reads a part of the of the costume of the of the chameleon uh, of his uh, cop costume so it people can see that below he has the, the spider-man costume as well and that's how they arrest him yeah it was a lucky break yeah, exactly. And uh, that will happen uh, a few other times in, in the book that obviously is not very at ease with his powers yet and uh, is really fresh at it. And uh, sometimes he will have just lucky lucky wins uh, like this one. Mm-hmm. Well, shall we move on to issue number two? Yeah. Uh, so issue number two, we have two stories there. Uh, one with the, the vulture uh, and one with the tinkerer. So the vulture is a thief, uh, and Spider-Man tra- tries to catch him, obviously, but at the same time, he also becomes a photographer uh, for the Daily Bugle. So he wants to, he's more interested in catching good pictures than catching the villain at the end of the day. And the second story with the Tinkerer is more of a silly story um, with the Tinkerer being a guy inserting special mechanism into the into scientists radios and peter is working for one of those scientists and he realizes that those radios are not working properly or have different ways strange waves so he finds out that uh, a bunch of aliens including the tinkerer are trying to maybe take over the planet and uh, well and he saves the day so the incredible amount of stuff in both stories but more of a mixed bag between the Vulture, which is really a traditional Spider-Man story, and this one, which is more, and the Tinkerer one, which is more of a city story. Yeah, the Tinkerer story is more of your standard Marvel anthology, 1950s, 1960s kind of story, uh, where yeah. a lot of the times in those stories, the bad guy ended up being, or the person in the story ended up being an alien at the end. Like, that was a, a very common trope at the time. Mm. And I think that they've retconned out the fact that the Tinkerer is an alien now because he's yeah. come back a few times and i think he's just a an old guy uh, i think he was there in uh he, he was there in the in the recent second spider-man title the the the, spe- the new spectacular title oh, okay which is, which is great fun by the way uh which has definitely a 60s vibe or 70s vibes it's, it's really a fun book um the one by chip starsky um and the tinkerers in it nice so it has red con definitely so it's interesting that both of the stories here deal with old men as the the antagonist. Mm. Uh, and the vulture, um, and I guess if you even count J. Jonah Jameson in there, and there's a third old guy as an antagonist, that he's working for Now Magazine, not the Daily Bugle. Yeah, true. true. So that's, a, that's just something they haven't quite formalized yet either. Mm. And the vulture, he doesn't have any plans other than he just wants to steal a shipment of diamonds and so Mm. he's a thief and he publicly boasts that he's going to be able to do it under everybody's nose Um, not the same mo as the vulture usually has um, later on that's for sure Mm. and again peter defeats the vulture he doesn't defeat the vulture the the vulture is kind of outdone by just old age sure peter kind of comes up with a contraption that'll depower his his wings Mm -hmm. but when he falls when the vulture falls he's not able to fight back because he's just old Mm, maybe he broke his hip or something yeah the wind (laughs) got knocked out of me what will i do and then the cops come and arrest him so it was kind of another lucky break there what i think is interesting about this story uh also is the fact that it's the brainy aspect of peter that allows me to uh, allows him to uh, destroy the mechanism of the vulture uh, so in just one page once again he creates the the his sort 
sort of utility belt with the cartridges for the for for his web spinners, and uh, and he identified this mechanism that will allow him to uh, short circuit the, the the vultures flying system. It's something that writers have forgotten over the years that this guy is is is, is very clever, and uh, and that science uh, gets him into to being Spider-Man, and it's not just because he's a physical person, uh, because he's not in the first place, but also because he's a brainy guy. One of the, uh, another thing which is unrelated is the fact that in the page where uh, when the vulture throws Spider-Man into the, the water tank, the way he escapes, you know, using the the water and the, the the pressure of the water is also a technical solution. So it's a very it's a very clever uh, way of getting out of this uh, of this water tank. That that was a good example of Steve Ditko's storytelling in that whole water tower scene because you get some really good mm. drama with him being trapped in there, not knowing what to do. The water is kind of like he can't hold up forever. He can't stick to the walls, and then being able to show the solution uh, the way that he did was really really clever as well. Uh, it just takes a good mm. a good artist to be able to convey all of those different themes there. So great story, and uh, yeah, the the and this, but the second one was a. Uh, was more of a letdown for me when uh, obviously there are all fun stories to read but uh, uh, you know sometimes when you read classic stories you're like oh I'm not supposed to say something bad about it because <laughs> it's classic but no no you know, go for it this one's silly and silly yep. what I really like it's I think it's the first time in in the second part uh, of the story the Tinkerer one that we see the split head with the spider sense oh and, yeah you know half of uh, uh, Peter's head being uh, with the mask, but not the mask in the full color. So that this small visual trick is a fantastic way of reminding people that is how his powers work and so on. So I think it's really clever, and we will see that all, all along the years as well. Um, but it was a clever uh, visual device, a uh, visual uh, element from Ditko. And I think it's important to to do that for new readers who, like in this era we're not used to seeing masked heroes like this per se. Superman didn't have a mask. Wonder Woman didn't have a mask. And Batman kind of had a half mask, but no one was fully masked like this. I mean, I'm mm. sure there were other ones who were masked like this, but but when you put Peter Parker and Spider-Man side by side, there's no indication that they are who they are. So yeah. by putting a half mask on them, it gives us this clue, especially to kids who are picking up Spider-Man for the first time. Oh, okay, I'm now associating Peter Parker with Spider-Man. That's the way it should be. Right. Okay, in this issue, um, Moose, the bully Moose from the previous couple of issues is now renamed Flash. This is Flash Thompson. Mm. And yeah, you know, the, I, I agree with you. This is not that great of a story. It doesn't feel like it fits in with the rest of the book, especially with Aliens. Because Peter mm-hmm. Parker and Spider Man is so down to earth for the rest of the for the rest of this book here to deal with aliens is just kind of bizarre. But this is something that happens in all of these '60s books. There are always mm. multiple different alien groups visiting Earth and then fleeing when the hero kind of defeats them. It happened in Ant Man several times. It happened in Thor a bunch of times, and yeah, it's happening here too. It's just mm. one of the things that Stan kind of always went back to. And there is a reason why the Tinkerer is not in the top tier of Spider-Man's rogues gallery. He's just not that interesting. Yeah, yeah it's true. Okay, issue number three. Let's talk about a great issue now. Um, this one's mm. the strangest foe of all time, Dr. Octopus. And this is Doc Ock's origin story. He's a scientist and he uses these mechanical arms in order to extend his grip and so he can stay protected behind a glass barrier because he deals with radiation and different chemicals and there's an explosion, and the arms get fused to him, and somehow, through the wonders of comic book science, he is now has a, a, a mental link with the arms. He can control them, and then he uses this to try and take over an atomic research plant, and Spider-Man comes and tries to stop him. Wow, this is our first full-length Spider-Man story, and it is a great mm. one. And either Dr. Octopus or Green Goblin is always considered to be Spider-Man's top villain. And you can see why in this one, um, I think in particular with Dr. Octopus, because we're doing, we're, we're battling brains with brains. Like we have two scientists 
and they are facing off of e off of with each other and yeah they have physical strength to battle each other but really they battle each other with their minds and nowhere does this become more obvious than when mod in modern days when 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 Dr. Octopus takes over Peter Parker's body and becomes a superior mm -hmm. Spider-Man um that they really play that up there but it all starts here it, it all starts here and uh you know when in retrospect now we can see how alike uh they 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 could, they are or they could have been uh and that's played very well in the in the second Spider-Man movie yeah because they are the same type of guys i mean dark tech guys uh scientists often laughed at by others because they are kind of nerds they both suffer from an accident they get specific abilities because of an accident and uh, one turns to good doing good things and the one turns to evil uh, but it, it's like the flip of a coin really because uh, that's what makes uh, also Doc Ock so interesting because in, in a different situation he would have been a great father figure for Peter Parker and, this, and once again the second Spider-Man movie played that incredibly well and uh, and I think that's one of the great strengths strengths of the of the character yeah absolutely a funny thing also is that uh, of course the octopus uh, has visually speaking can have some visual ties with the with the spider with all the extra arms so that that adds more connection to visual connection to two characters what i think is interesting though is the the fact that from the beginning spider-man in this issue is very full of himself and uh, he's always saying well i wish i had more uh, difficult uh, opponents and when he gets to, into the first fight with dr octopus he's very confident that he's going to uh, to knock him out in, in in seconds and he finds out that well he was overconfident and uh, and he lost and that leads him to reconsider his role as spider-man and, uh, and seeing himself as a failure and almost quitting and it's the moment when the human torch plays a part a very interesting part of re-motivating uh, him and that's the beginning of their friendship even though they don't meet as uh, the torch and peter parker but uh, we see how they they, they connect uh, and how the, the torch can be an inspiration for for peter parker as well and uh, obviously he gets back uh, on top and uh, and finally saves the day once again using some technical stuff uh, and some very clever uh, solutions, uh, not by just knocking out uh, Doc Ock, but there are some uh, clever elements as well. So yeah, it's a, it's a great story. Yeah, I really like the scene with with uh, Torch and Spider Man because at this time, you know, Human Torch has his own title as well, and he's a teenager also. Mm. So we have the two teenager characters that are introduced here in in Marvel Comics. And they're on opposite sides because Peter Parker is the tortured teen with the powers that he doesn't understand and the world that doesn't accept him. But then Johnny, he revels in his powers. He loves them. He He's famous. He gets mobbed by people wherever he goes. Um, and, and his identity is publicly known, so it's not a huge deal. So we have these two characters coming together so that they can support each other especially so that Johnny can support Peter but then also so that Johnny has someone I don't know like him that's his own age mm. because his the other mm. people on his team are not his own age uh, so it's yeah it's it's a nice it's a nice partnership built out of the you know the two the only two teen superheroes that Marvel has at this point page 72 this one red panel where Dr. Octopus is causing the explosion is fantastic mm -hmm. I love that yeah. uh, he decided to, to portray it that way. It's like it's got caught at the exact moment of the blast and you can feel, mm. kind of, you can see the, the clothes kind of ripping away and just all of this stuff going on. It, it's just a great panel. I, I think that uh, also the, the, there's one page when Doc Ock captures Spider-Man with his arms, you know, just before he throws him away from the out of the window. Uh, and the layout of the page is completely different because it's only a four panel page. Yeah. And, uh, and the way that he deals with Spider-Man and he just slaps him. Uh, I, I mean, this page is fantastically drawn. It's a, it's a great looking page. The slap is so great because 
Dr. Octopus mm. himself doesn't have any powers. It's all in those arms. And so the fact that mm. he's able to walk up to Spider-Man, who has super speed and super strength, and just slap him in the face, it's like the ultimate mm. insult right there. The mm. ultimate insult of his powers, of the way that Spider-Man works, his abilities. Like, it's just, it's so it's so great, that one panel right there. The, the great, great, great panels all yeah. over the issue. Um, I also want to note that on page 76, which is um, page 8 of the issue, Dr. Octopus calls Spider-Man Superman. <laughs> another another mistake there. Everyone loves to point that one out, and I do too. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's move on to issue number four. Yep. So called Nothing Can Stop the Sandman. So it's uh, I, I think it should be the first time uh, someone used the Nothing Can Stop, <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. which the, 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 the key sentence for the juggernaut afterwards. Once again, the Sandman is a thief. Spider-Man literally bumps into him and, uh, well, and they, they have a first fight uh, when his mask is ripped. He waits the pros and the cons of considering the fight and, and lets the, the Sandman go away uh, because he doesn't want to uh, have his identity publicly revealed. He reshapes, he redraws, uh, he resews his costume, and uh, and at the end of the day, finally gets the Sandman after a uh, after a very long fight at the university. And he has, and once again, he's using a very clever way of uh, to 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 arrest the Sandman because he's using the uh, he's using a Hoover. To, to to capture <laughs> the Sandman and uh, and that's very that's very silly but that's clever at the same time. We see in this story something that will be sort of a pattern in in a lot of the stories uh, throughout is that basically Spidey confronts the villain, is defeated the first time, and then he finds uh, he later finds a way to analyze better the fight and uh, and find a solution on how to. To, to win the fight in the in the end, there are many first things taking place in this issue uh, beyond the fact and the, the beyond the, the first appearance of the uh, of the Sandman. It's the first appearance of Betty Brown. It's also the first time that the villain pops up into the uh, Peter High School. It's the first time also that uh, uh, Spider-Man uses the, his web on on JJJ's chair uh, <laughs> and it's the first time also that he's faking pictures uh, at the end uh, of the story so there's a lot of first time in, the, in this issue it's also the first time that he's publicly fought a supervillain um, because oh, yeah, this right. was uh, um, I mean, he made a public appearance saving the astronaut but that wasn't a, as a crime fighter mm-hmm. all of the stuff with the vulture or maybe no, actually, he, I guess he was do, doing the vulture stuff publicly as well. Maybe that's not the right comment. Mm. I can't remember. Does do people say, "Hey, there's Spider-Man"? Mm. No, I guess not. No, no, uh, the vulture one. He's not seen by anybody. Doctor Octopus is all behind the scenes. It's a very personal battle. Um, I mean, he leaves a little note when he's webbed up saying Spider-Man, but no one actually sees him do it. So this is the first time he's kind of out in public um, at the school mm-hmm. fighting a bad guy. Like he stands on top of the school and everybody notices him there. So that's very interesting. Mm. Um, okay, so Steve Ditko does his own inks through the, through this book. And mm. I really like the way he inks Sandman because it's completely oh, yeah. different than the way he inks any other person. Um Absolutely. He, to make him look like he's going to fall apart. So mm. I thought that was a really nice touch, especially if you go to page 102, you can see that when he's in the classroom, just the way that he kind of feathers the 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 lines on mm. uh, Sandman's face and even his clothes and stuff makes it look like he is composed of sand, I guess. So it's a nice effect. Mm. Uh, also, um, okay, here's the page right here. If you go to page... 12 of this issue which is page 103 in the epic collection the bottom Mm -hmm. panel the very bottom panel where flash gordon is saying who that coward he's probably hiding with his head under a desk somewhere the girl Mm -hmm. the brown-haired girl underneath him that's Mm -hmm. jessica jones right there yeah Yeah. and this one is told in um in amazing spider-man number 601 
when Peter okay. and uh, Jessica Jones are having a conversation. Um, he had just revealed his identity in an issue of New Avengers, and the the conversations continued in Amazing Spider-Man 601, and she explains to him, yeah. like you were saying, that she had a major crush on him at the time, and he didn't even know that uh, she existed. Uh, and they use this panel, specifically use this panel, to point out that mm -hmm. that's Jessica Jones in the school there. True. So that's the that's the, the the story when he says, "Oh, you were coma girl." Coma girl, <laughs> yes, that's the right. <laughs> yeah, coma that, girl. That's, uh, that's the one. Yep. That's the one drawn by Joe Quesada and uh, written by Brian Bendis, I think. Um, it's the backup of Amazing Six Hundred One. Yes, Six Hundred and One. Yeah, I can't remember who drew it. I remember but, that. Yep, it was Bendis mm, for sure. I think it's Joe. I think it's Joe Quesada, but uh, okay, can be sure. I also like the way that Sandman is creative with his powers. He's very different than the Sandman nowadays where, you know, he just creates a big um, hammer with his fist. But, like, he turns himself mm. into a quicksand at one point, which is ridiculous mm. because it's just sand on the ground. It's not like he's going to sink through the ground. <laughs> but um, mm. Or, like, he, he's stealing the money and he just turns himself into a pile of sand to cover up the money. As some as cops run by, and I think that's a kind of a cool little effect too. Absolutely, the the, the way that he uses his power and it is really sometimes it's a bit like a bit of Mister Fantastic uh, because yeah. he can use any part of his body uh, when he's hitting uh, with Spider Man with his belly, and you know you using this kind of strange angle to his body. So so it's a, it's very funny, interesting use of his, uh, of his power. But it's once again, Sandman is once again uh, an atomic character because he, it's once again some uh, atom atomic explosion that co that gives him his, his power, like Doctor Octopus. So it's something which is very commonplace in the in the sixties, obviously. Yep, and he's just a normal guy, a thief. He has no super yes. costume or anything like that. Yeah, and he never get. Oh, I guess he does get a costume. Jack Kirby gives him one a little later in Fantastic Four, but. When he's the with the frightful four. That's right. Yeah. The wizard and um, and the trapster and Medusa, I think. That's right. Yeah. If I remember well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we'll move on to number five, marked for destruction by Doctor Doom. Doctor Doom tries to r relate to Spider Man, if you can believe it, in order to persuade <laughs> him to join forces with him against the Fantastic Four. So they're really playing up the Fantastic Four connections in these first issues. We had a full Fantastic Four cameo in issue one. We had uh, Human Torch show up in issue number three, and now we have Doctor Doom in issue number five. Hmm. It's great to see Doctor Doom in this one. Um, we get a recap of how he survived. This is this is kind of a funny thing because every time Doctor Doom apparently dies in Fantastic Four in these early issues, mm -hmm. when he returns, he always has to explain how he got out of the previous situation. And so mm -hmm. this is the same case here. He has to explain how he got out of the his predicament at the end of the previous appearance in Fantastic <laughs> Four when he was floating away. So he did that. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he tries to relate to Spider-Man. It's like, we're both kind of uh, misunderstood by the public. We both don't like the Fantastic Four. They've both snubbed us in the past. Well, why don't we? Uh, why don't we team up here? And I love the the parallel story of Flash Thompson dressing up as Spider Man to try and uh, just gag as a gag, try and get a rise out of Peter Parker because Peter Parker says mm. that he's afraid of Spider Man. But then Doctor Doom mistakes him for the real thing. It's just the whole timing of that situation where Doctor Doom's watching. Um, he's put like mm. this chemical on Peter Parker, but then Spider Man, Flash Thompson, Spider Man happens to be standing there at the right time. It's just like a comedy of errors. It's it's fantastic. It's a great, great storytelling. It's it's really it's really great also to see this kind of uh, funny aspect given to Doctor Doom because that's not the way you would see it. Right. Yeah. Not these days. Not these days, and uh, not even later in the in the standard stuff. So it was really really fun to see the difference in the, uh, and also the fact that he follows the public voice around Spider Man and he says, "Well, this guy uh, is also a villain because well, the papers say that he's a villain, so it could be a, a nice way to uh, to work together and uh, and fight the Fantastic Four." So that's really funny. What I like in this story is that 
Stanley is establishing things and it looks like he's more in, uh, he knows more where he's going because we've seen that in the previous issue that Liz Allen um, is changing her uh, view of Peter Parker and, and getting more interest in Peter Parker. And here uh, he clearly establishes that there's, there will be some sort of chemistry between Peter and Betty Brown. Um, so that's a, that's a very nice way of establishing this uh, this uh, uh, sort of relationship between the three of them. And I think that, well, the, the, the funny aspect of, once again, the, the, the Flash Thompson uh, pretending to be Spider-Man works really well and a uh, great comedy moment there. I love the, the scene where in order to try and get out of the house, because um, Aunt May won't let him leave because of Dr. Mm. Doom and stuff like that. So he, he purposely blows a fuse in the fuse box Yeah, and says, oh, I have to go out and buy fuses. And he leaves Aunt May alone in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> and just mm. like you just stay here and uh, and then goes to battle Dr. Doom and then at the very like he must be gone for quite a long time to with all mm. of the stuff that goes on here and then at the end he goes back home and it's still dark and uh, he didn't get the fuses <laughs> Aunt May doesn't really have any personality at this point no her only lines are I hate that Spider-Man. He's just such an awful character. And you know how fragile you are. You should really rest or don't go exactly. in the cold or whatever. Mm. Those are the oh, only things. Yeah, like yeah. Mm. Those mm -hmm. are the only things she says right now. So mm. it's uh, she's just kind of used more as a little bit of a comic relief or a plot device. Interestingly, issue five has Doctor Doom. And it's something that uh, when John Byrne drew She-Hulk, which was a funny book at the time, he noticed that all the fifth issues of the first uh, of the major first uh, Marvel titles had Doctor Doom in issue five. The Hulk had Doctor Doom in issue five, uh, obviously the Fantastic Four, and, and now Spider -Man, uh, Spider Man as well. Wow, isn't that weird? <laughs> That's what, that was the trivia bit. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, okay. You have anything more for this? Oh, I should say um, at the end of here, Doctor Doom is caught in his own trap. So he doesn't really... It's another instance of Spider-Man not really defeating the bad guy. Um, he kind of uh, just kind of haphazardly gets his way through. And then the Fantastic Four show up and Doctor Doom gets afraid and runs away. <laughs> so it's like... Mm. It's kind of a weird ending for it. Um, yeah, that's not... And, and that's not very Doctor Doom. -ish. No, it's very not <laughs> Doctor Doom at away. all. But, yeah. Mm. Uh, let's move on to issue number six. Yeah. Uh, this one is called face-to-face -face with the lizard. So we know that there is this lizard character terrorizing the, the Everglades. And for the first time, there is a, this idea of the, the bugle challenging Spider-Man to defeat a character or to uh, using the bugle as a way to, to tease Spider-Man into fighting a character. And we would see that very frequently in, the, in forthcoming issues as well. So, but Spider-Man has to fly to, to fly to Florida because he can't do it by himself. So Peter tries to find a way to convince JJJ to having fly to Florida and so on and so forth. Uh, long story short, he succeeds, and we see then the fight with. Uh, we see a very similar pattern to previous issues where there is a first fight against the lizard. Uh, he's a bit too confident. He loses the fight, and then. Uh, ends up uh, meeting the family of Dr. Kurt Connors because at the time we don't know who the, who the lizard can be. Uh, the family of, the, of Kurt Connors explains the origin of the lizard and then uh, once again Spider-Man finds a scientific way to uh, restore, uh, to, to cure the lizard and in the end Dr. Connors is restored as a normal person but now we know that it won't last so this one is kind of the first issue where spider-man kind of goes on a little road trip because mm. he'll be taken all over the world fighting these super villain guys and it's so it, it's interesting that the the villain uh the lizard who becomes a mainstay for spider-man is like he had to kind of seek out this character he had to go out of his way to find the lizard mm. I, I like this character lizard's always been my favorite and i think possibly um, you know, when you're younger, you always identify with the, either the heroes or villains who have the same name as you. 
So Kurt mm. Kurt Connors. <laughs> I really liked Nightcrawler for the same reason. His name mm. is Kurt Wagner. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, other than that, Lizard has always been one of my favorite favorite characters as well because it's just like he's not actually a villain. It's another character that kind of something an accident happened to him and the bad circumstance has kind of pushed him into the direction that he's gone. He's not really a super villain. So, but uh yeah, I love I love this story. This is a this is a really good issue. And uh and once again, it's the the same kind of villain uh, than Doctor Doom. So, he could have been and he is a force of, for the greater good uh and we will see in the future obviously that is quite a supporting character for 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 Spider-Man. Yeah. Uh to this very day uh, and to current issues of Amazing Spider-Man he, he still is. But yeah, this accident and the, the, once again he was trying to cure himself so that's even more of a tragic thing uh and he ends up being a villain instead because through the fact that he becomes a reptile and his brain flips into a different uh well more of a reptilian kind of uh behavior so that's uh yeah that's the tragic of the story as well it's kind of a what if it's like instead of uh like what if peter parker were bit by a radioactive lizard instead of a radioactive spider because there are very there are a lot of similarities in their story he gains all these powers but peter retains his intellect whereas kurt connor's does not mm. there's also I love the transformation scene on page 146, very Ditko. It reminds me of a lot of the 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 short stories he did for Marvel in the early years where, you know, mm-hmm. horrible things would happen to people and there's a kind of a horror element to to this transformation. You see the similar kind of thing like, you know, when Bruce Banner turns into the Hulk. Yeah. It's the first very monster-like character. Yep, yeah, that's true. Visually, visually speaking, it's quite a it's quite a departure from the the other character, who uh, the bad guys we've seen. But still not a supervillain because he doesn't have like a super suit or anything like that, a, a supervillain mm-hmm. outfit. Um, okay, so also I am th- at this point I'm starting to f- feel like the the comic book the artistic liberties that they're using with Spider-Man's intellect are becoming a little much. We're expected to believe <laughs> that a high schooler comes up with the cure for the lizard. And has come up with this anti-electronic device for the vulture and his web shooters. And, like, this is a lot for for a high schooler. Like, this guy should be working for the government, to, to, you know, developing, like, military stuff with Tony Stark or something like mm. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a bit of a stretch. It's, uh, it's uh, how convenient. Can yeah, be. it is. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, on page 153, we have um, six panels, which is not unusual for Ditko, except that these ones are all uh, vertical panels because we're fighting in mm-hmm. this uh, this silo of some sort, uh, yeah. and it's it's just really cool. It's a uh, the fight in that little place between the two of them is really cool. Yeah, it reminds me of the 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 the, the, the visual aspect that Ditko would be using in specific locations for specific fight scenes, like with Mysterio afterwards and so on. So he's using very clever. I think he's using the location in a very clever way. Yeah. Because he, he, seeing the fight from above, for instance, in the second and third panel is very interesting because that's not something you would see normally. But it it, it lays out the story very dynamically. Hmm. Yeah. You, it's almost like you're falling along with them and like the camera is following them uh, as they fall. So it's very interesting. So one of the yep. things that I don't like about Epic Collections is mm-hmm. uh, is the fact that it's soft cover. So that means the binding is really tight and there's a lot of gutter loss. And you can really see it in this issue, mm-hmm. especially in the, on the first page of this issue where they're looking like the binding is just so tight between the two pages. There's a, There's... Unless you're like wrenching the book open and possibly breaking the spine, mm. the image kind of gets lost in the middle there. That's just a minor thing. It's a it's not a huge deal mm. unless you have a two page spread. Then there's quite a bit of loss of information. But Silver Age comics were made a lot wider than modern comics. So mm. when you have the the modern comic book dimensions, which is this book, but you you try to fit in the wider dimensions of Silver Age comics, then yeah, you get more gutter loss than than normal okay let's go into number seven return of the vulture so 
this is the first time a villain, a Spider-Man villain, is making a return. Uh, Vulture mm-hmm. breaks out of prison and makes a new flying device that's even better than the last one and counters Spidey's anti-magnetic device from before. So now Spider-Man mm-hmm. has to figure out how to defeat this new Vulture. This one was kind of a little silly. It wasn't as a... I didn't like it as much as the first villain, um, although uh, it's still it's still a decent issue. But I think the biggest thing that was nice about this is this the, the relationship between... Peter and Betty, how that's kind of further developed, mm. and the comedy between Spider-Man and J. Jonah Jameson, because they're doing a big fight through the Daily Bugle. <laughs> and so, mm. just with Jonah yeah. kind of caught in the middle. So, there's a lot of uh, great comedy moments in here that I enjoyed. That, that, that's a very funny story, because of that, but it's true that a lot of it doesn't make any sense, like how the vulture recreates his wing in jail. Uh, and escapes yeah. thanks to the fact that he's being manufacturing his wings in jail. So this is really silly, but it, it's a bit of a strange issue compared to to, to other ones. Uh, but the ending and the fight in the Daily Bugle is really, really, really fun. What I also like is the fact that it's the first time that uh, Spider-Man twists uh, his arm, uh, which is something that we will see all the time in the future. Seeing those things for the first time is really fresh, and uh, and, and and amusing uh, at the same time. Yeah, it's the first time also that uh, we see the webbed mouse. Uh, you know when uh, Spidey uses web to shut up JJJ. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun issue, really. It's not perfect, but it's fun. Yeah, the the scene where they are flying, uh, where the, they're doing a fight in mid air. Where Vulture mm-hmm. and Spider-Man are, he uh, and Steve Ditko uses the same six-panel vertical panel layout that he did with the last thing that mm-hmm. we saw, um, because mm-hmm. again we're we are seeing this fight from a different angle, so we need different panels in order to show that perspective. So it yeah, it's nice to see that. Yeah, it's like you're flying around them, so you see different angles. Like there would be like you know. Uh, a 360 degrees around the fight. Yeah. And and Ditko is a master of putting just enough detail. He doesn't overly detail his stuff, but he puts in all of the elements that we need to know. So especially in these top two panels uh, where most of it's sky and the bottom right panel on this page, on 175, um, mm. you just see little bits of the city poking up from the bottom of the panel. And the rest of it's blank because either it's blank with sky or it's and you hint at clouds or it's blank with water and there's a small boat to indicate that. Mm. It's just enough information that we need in order to understand where they are. And I think it's uh, it's quite well done. Yeah, and uh, he's using small details in his shoe, which I think, once again, is really, really interesting. You know, with the, the fact that when they are fighting all over the Daily Bugle, paper is flying everywhere. Yeah. And you see that yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in the two or three page before the, the, the page you were mentioning, because there's play, paper flying all the time, and uh, it gives a, a different aspect uh, to the story, and that's what makes it very fun for me, for instance, because it's obvious that there would be p- uh, paper flying everywhere, but the fact that he draws them uh, just gives little detail, but a sort of realistic aspect to it. But it's important as well because... Um, that's also information that you need to know because this is a confined space. It's cluttered. It's mm. it's uh, with the paper flying everywhere. You get a sense that they are boxed in in this office. Whereas when you don't have any of those details in the the, the scene where they're flighting in the air, is because it's it's totally wide open. So it's again mm. he's putting in the details that you need to know. He's not overcomplicating the artwork. He's just conveying exactly the stuff that needs to be there. And what a great final page. I love it. I mean, I, I remember that I loved it when I was a kid and I read it the first time. I mean, he's always been the the, 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 the loser. Peter has always been the loser. And for once, he wins the day uh, and he gets the girl in the end. I mean, there couldn't be a better ending. Yeah. He People often forget that Betty Brandt is his first girlfriend. It's like they think always think of Mary exactly. Jane, and they're like, "Oh yeah, before Mary Jane was Gwen Stacy." But no, Betty was a a very important part in these early issues, and yeah. uh, she always gets given the the short end of the stick in movies and on TV and stuff. 
No, and you, you, when you when you read this, these stories, because uh, she will be phased out uh, after issue twenty something, uh, and especially around thirty when um, Gwen Stacy arrives and so on. Yeah, but uh, she's very important there. So we come to a point now where either we need to stop or this is going to be a three-hour episode. So I think let's cut it here. And in the next episode, we'll talk about issues number 8 to 17 plus the annual. What do you th- say about that, Frank? Yeah, hey. that's, a, that's a very good idea because there's way too much stuff to cover in those early issues. Yeah, definitely. We, could, uh, we don't want to give any of these the short end of the stick because they are all fantastic. So we'll pick it up next time, mm. and we'll see you in the next episode. Mm.